So welcome back everybody and we're just going to enter, enter a session now of questions and answers. There will be a, a walking microphone going around. If you have a question or a comment just raise your hand and the person will come to you and you can ask the question. Just to let you know we listened to a lot in the first session. Tomorrow all of tonight's talk will be on our website. Well there will be a link on our website that will take you to all of tonight's talk, all two hours of it, including the questions and answers. So if you go into our web, webcam, you know where our webcam screen is, that you follow us live on the net. Underneath that, there's a little link to Church Services TV. So if you click Church Services TV, it'll bring you into the Church Services website. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that screen, it lists all of the recordings we have here in Clonner Church. And tomorrow, thanks to Modern Technology, the talk here tonight will be there. So, go into our webcam. You with me? Into our webcam. Underneath the webcam, under the screen, Church Services TV. If you click on Church Services TV, it brings you into the Church Services website. And scroll down underneath Clonard there, and all the recordings, including Sunday homilies, the first talk by Richard Gilliardi, and tonight's talk by Eamon Phoenix. So Eamon, we welcome you back for our question and answer session. Tommy is here at the front and Tommy will go to whoever raises their hand for a question. I'm sorry some of you couldn't hear me. I mean, I think the acoustics are not perfect with the church not being, you know, completely full, but hopefully you can hear me a bit better now. Have we any questions or points anybody wants to raise? Gentleman here, yes. Um, thanks very much. I, I'm no problem saying that I, I would come from a, a nationalist viewpoint without a doubt. But um, I think the point you raised was um, one of the things that was seen as unfair was the difference in treatment of the host gun running and the Lauren gun running, which maybe led to a lot of feeling of isolation or, or alienation. But before that, was anything done on the nationalist side to maybe try and assuage the fears of the unionists to maybe try and persuade them that maybe home rule wouldn't be as bad as they were making out? It's a very good question. I mean, clearly, the generous offers to unionism came too late. When you get to 1917, 1918, there was a final attempt to solve the Irish question called the Irish Convention, a round table conference in Dublin. Carson sent an Ulster Unionist delegation, the Nationalists were there, the Southern Unionists were there, churchmen were there. And as a result of that meeting, Redmond and the Southern Unionists, led by Lord Middleton, uh, came up with a, a package whereby in a Home Rule Parliament, the Unionists would have 40% of the seats. Now, they were only entitled to 25% um, if you counted heads. That came in 1918, when partition was virtually staring Ireland in the face. Um, we have to say that reconciliation, looking back on it, looking back at the fears, and we know that the acreage of partition, you know, was never fixed. Had Redmond been prepared to accept a four-county split in 19? Uh, 12, when it was first mooted, which would have included Derry and Urie as separate counties. So you're really talking about even less than four counties. It would have left unionism with Antrim down, County Derry except for the city, and uh, County Armagh except for Newry. Um, and uh, the border would have been a very soft one because Home Rule, Home Rule Ireland and the excluded counties would still have been represented at Westminster. You still would have had an All-Ireland Police Force. You still would have had the British Army. It would be like going from Down District Council to Lisburn District Council today. Um, but because the nationalists, for obvious reasons, wouldn't contemplate the division of Ireland at all, and Redmond said it was an abomination and a blasphemy, then there was no attempt from the nationalist side to engage and finally, in 1916, after the rising, Carson went for six counties, and the nationalists were reluctantly prepared to go along with that. Now, it collapsed in the end, but that became the area. In terms of reconciliation, I suppose looking back, it would need to have happened earlier. We would need to have seen some sort of continuum from the United Irishmen in the 1790s into the early 19th century. You know that liberal golden age, if 1798 had been slightly different, if Wexford 
hadn't happened, the sectarian excesses in Wexford, which had such an effect in dissuading Ulster Presbyterians from nationalism after 1798. Or if the land movement in the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, which did bring farmers north and south together, if that had been built on in some way, um, if there'd been more cooperation, an attempt to reconcile. One nationalist politician actually urged reconciliation in the early 20th century. His name was William O'Brien from County Cork. And he eventually led a breakaway nationalist movement. Uh, and he talked about the need to reconcile Ulster and to break down what were then 300-year-old barriers. We're facing 400-year-old barriers today. And we're aware of the burden of our history in a way. And I think nationalists like Joe Devlin tended to overemphasize the importance of that pool of Protestant liberal home rulers, like Armour, like Casement, you know, uh, like Jeremiah Jordan, uh, Fermanagh, na a nationalist uh, MP, and Methodist lay preacher um, who sat at Westminster as a nationalist. There are a lot of them around, you know. I mean, looking at the covenant, you could say, of course, that you know, there was still fair patches of liberalism around in 1912-14. Only half the population of the Ards in County Down, only half the Protestant population signed the covenant. 50% of the people around Newton Ards of a Presbyterian background didn't sign the covenant at all. That's significant. Armour was able to call a meeting of 500 Presbyterian home rulers in Ballymoney Town Hall in 1913 as a protest against partition. North Antrim, in Paisley country, had a Home Rule MP in 1910. There were signs that, you know, not all Ulster Protestants felt the enormity of um, this issue of Catholic discrimination under Home Rule. But it was very misfortunate that the McCann case, that first of all, the Ne Temere decree from Rome followed by the McCann case in Belfast, with all the, the, the hurt and the angst and the tragedy in family terms of that case, happened just as the Home Rule Bill was passing through the House of Commons. I mean, it's very interesting that the Catholic hierarchy in Germany asked for Germany to be exempted from Ne Temere because it had a mixed population. But it was applied to Ireland, which had far more religious problems and sectarian problems, you know. So that happens at the same time. So I suppose the idea of the papal interference in marriage and social matters was hyped up by unionist spokesmen in 1912-14. Um, one nationalist, one Republican of that period was a man called Cahar Healy, who was a journalist from County Fermanagh, one of the founders of Sinn Féin. He became the father of the House of Commons at Stormont and bowed out in the mid-1960s. And I read his memoirs. And he actually said, which is true, in 1907, the Liberal government proposed what they called a council for Ireland. Very low level. Not a parliament, just a council that would have control of certain matters and there would be a committee system. Kind of thing we have today to some extent at Stormont. And he, looking back after 50 years of partition and sectarian division, said that might have been a better way forward, to get something quite low level and build tolerance and trust, and then move on from that, you know? But it was never really addressed until the 11th hour, 1918, two years before partition. I mean, how real do you rate the economic problems of the time? I mean, the fact that uh, the shipyards and the linen mills and all that sort of thing were, as you say, immersed in a free trade notion of the empire. I mean, would it, in the home rule legislation, what was the situation to be uh, regarding economic matters? Can you say something I just like missed that? you now. Sorry, what? Uh, what? Uh, regard, I'm thinking really of economic matters, you know, yes, yes, what, was the, what was the legislation like in the Home Rule? Oh yes. For well, economic yes. matters? 
Well, of course, the key thing was a home rule parliament would have no bearing on the empire or on imperial trade or on whether Britain declared war on Germany or on um, any succession issues around the crown. They were the critical issues to be determined by the mother of parliaments in London. This was a devolved assembly. In fact, Churchill, in his Belfast speech, justified home rule on pragmatic grounds. He said, the business of the House of Commons is being blocked by Irish matters, Scottish matters. We need home rule all round. We need to really shift a lot of the minutiae out of Westminster to parliaments in Dublin, Edinburgh and Cardiff. You know, that's what he was saying, if we are to deal with the great issues of state. So in many ways, there was no immediate threat to northern industry in a home rule parliament. Yes, it would have control of local industry and agriculture, but it, then it didn't have much financial power. But Redmond had made it clear that he was asking for the revision of the financial clauses. And obviously, the way devolution has gone in Canada and elsewhere, you know, and is happening in Scotland at the moment, home rule parliaments want to aggrandize more and more power to themselves. And I mean, that's really what was likely to happen. So the unionist fear was, first of all, I think the most basic bedrock, all pervasive fear, the very difficult to measure, was the fear that home rule was Rome rule. It was such a good slogan. And in Protestant eyes, there was a lot of evidence that the Catholic Church exerted an overweening influence in Irish public life. Uh, Ultramontanism, Cardinal Cullen, the role of the church in the downfall of Parnell, and then they Temeraid. In case you'd forgotten all that, suddenly in 1912, a case in the heart of Belfast, where Mrs. McCann alleged that her marriage broke up when a priest visited their home and told them they were living in sin because they hadn't been married in a, in a Roman Catholic church. Now that made headlines in the Unionist press. There were Protestant rallies from Belfast to Cornwall, you know, in 1910, 1912. There were debates in the House of Commons. So there's that aspect. But the economic issue, therefore, is a secondary one. The fear that Redmond and the Home Rulers would demand more and more financial um, autonomy and that they would obviously demand the right to set tariffs. So there was a lot of talk in Ireland, particularly in the more marginal movement, Sinn Féin, Arthur Griffith's movement, of fostering Irish industries. The coal of Kilkenny and Coal Island, you know, the turf bogs, you know, small industries. And that to protect these, an Irish parliament would seek tariff autonomy. The German economic historian Franz Liszt had argued that the key to um, greater independence for small nations was tariff autonomy. And there was a lot of talk about that. You know, seeking more financial power, introducing tariffs. So the business class, the captains of industries, the Harlands, the Wolfs, the Gallaghers, the James Craigs, whose father had a distillery across the road in Dunvilles, now the park, they were saying, a Home Rule Parliament is going to interfere in our business in that great free trade, uh, free trade area we call the British Empire. You know, it's very easy to see a justification for unionism when you consider that all this was happening when Belfast was at the pinnacle of its success. A soar away industrial city from the 1850s when they cut the Musgrave Channel, enabling Belfast to launch ocean-going liners, the golden thread that ran to the heart of the empire. By 1912, this was the city that never slept. It had the biggest everything in the world. The biggest, you know, flax spinning company in York Street. The biggest rope works, the biggest shipyard. Where was this going to stop? And then suddenly, these, in, you know, unionist racist terms, troglodytes from the bogs of Ireland are going to suddenly take over this marvelous machine. And of course, lacking economic experience, being mainly farmers, uh, and cattle drovers in unionist sort of um, terminology, they're going to wreck it. That was the fear. Thank goodness, that's science. Yes. <sighs> 
thank, thank you. It's maybe more of a reminiscence of my grandmother who came from an Ulster liberal family. And I recall 50 years ago when there was a celebration of the Ulster Covenant in then quite a triumphalist way by the Unionist and Orange um, authorities, how upset she was at the time. And I was surprised at that as a schoolboy, but she said it brought it back to her all the sort of tension of 1912 and that was within an Ulster Presbyterian liberal background and there are some family letters from the time which recall the Presbyterian minister in Portadown rather trying to finesse himself between the two sort of factions in the congregation and rather drawing a veil over the fact that in fact the covenant was supporting potentially physical force. So I think it, uh, the, two, the point you made that the Protestant community was not necessarily united behind the covenant and it did cause considerable tension within the Protestant community and unfortunately the tradition of dealing with Irish affairs with a measure of violence maybe had its roots in in that covenant. Well, absolutely. I mean, the majority of Ulster Protestants obviously refused to sign the covenant and signed an alternative one. And the language, I mean, just to give you a sense, I mean, the, it, it invokes the same biblical language. This one signed by Armour and Perry and um, Captain Jack White. We, the undersigned Ulster Protestant men and women over the age of 16, hereby repudiate the claim of Sir Edward Carson to represent the United Protestant opinion of Ulster, reject the doctrine of armed resistance to the legitimate decrees of Parliament, and declare our abhorrence of the attempt to revive ancient bigotries and dying habits in this province. We desire to live upon terms of friendship and equality with our Roman Catholic fellow countrymen, etc., etc., and they endorse Home Rule. Now, only 3,000 signed it, and uh, I think it was the Grand Secretary of the Orange Order in a debate with me on the radio recently said that was 1% of all those assigned covenants. And he's right. I mean, it was a small group. But in certain areas of the north of Ireland, they were significant. They were significant in North Antrim, in the route. They were significant around Money Ray and County Down, where a succession of non-subscribing Presbyterian ministers, the Reverend Harold Rylett, and then in the 20th century, the Reverend... Um, uh, Richard Little, had been Protestant home rulers. Uh, if you look up the 1911 census for Money Ray, you'll find 300 people in the dissenting Presbyterian area of Money Ray and North Down say they speak Irish. And some people said, when this came out a few years ago, ah, oh, they were just stupid people who thought that they had Irish accents. They weren't. They were all members of the Gaelic League, which the local minister ran in his church. So there was that interest in the Irish language among a lot of these people. But of course, they didn't see, in general, Ireland being divorced from the empire. They shared that kind of liberal Churchillian view of an Ireland stronger because it got devolution and an amity with Great Britain. Uh, ministers reacted in different ways. The father of Louis MacNeice, the rector of Carrickfergus, although a West of Ireland um, orangeman, refused to sign the covenant and actually canvassed his fellow clergymen in Carrickfergus and urged them not to sign it as a political document which endorsed force. In 1935, the same man as Bishop of Don and Connor would condemn the sectarian speeches of men in high places which led to the, the deaths on the streets in the 35 riots. You know, so there's that, uh, if you like, continuity there. Um, an uncle of Helen Waddell, the writer, uh, the Reverend John Waddell um, in Bangor refused to allow the covenant to be signed in his church, but for that he was hounded out of his church. You have different reactions in different places. Whereas J.B. Armour, very, very interesting man, opposed, uh, you know, supported home rule, supported land reform, detested landlordism, um, opposed partition until his dying day. Uh, he had seen an eviction scene in 1847 as a very young boy in North Antrim. And he recorded how he saw the hard toil tenant turned out on a day of snow. He said the landlord had a crowbar brigade. 
and the hard-toiled man was turned out half-clothed on the road with his children, but the landlord's horses and dogs were well clothed with velvet against the snow. And he said, from that day I determined, Armour said, to use whatever strength was mine to drive a nail into the evil system of landlordism in Ireland. And that began this radical pro-home rule stance, which meant that he stood against the tide at general assembly after general assembly as the anti-home rule motions were overwhelmingly endorsed, you know. He dies in 1928. It's interesting, though. Um, he never preached politics in his pulpit in, Car in um, Ballymoney. Um, he kept his congregation with him. Most of them were home rulers, big farmers, shopkeepers in North Antrim. And they called a centre after him. He founded Dalriada High School, of course, and they called a centre after him to this day, the Armour Centre in Ballymoney. Most unusual. Lady here, if you just wait for the mic, please. Uh, hello, Eamon. Sorry, gentlemen, uh, sorry. Uh, in the shadows. Very much. <laughs> in, in the days immediately after uh, the, the, the 29th of September, just after the centenary celebrations, I'll actually be involved in the restoration and the conservation of the Carson Monument at Stormont. I wonder, could you give us an insight into the ties that bound him to this place, to what his imperatives were? Was it the pursuit of principle? Was it the pursuit of power? You know, some insight into oh, yeah. Carson. Would be Very important. I mean, Carson, famously has been said of Carson, in Belfast he found a tomb, but never a home. He'd only been to Belfast once before 1910. He didn't particularly like it. His circuit was the Munster circuit, the Leinster circuit, where he took his early cases. His world was uh, being playing in St. Stephen's Green as a boy. His father was an architect. His mother was of landed gentry holidays in County Galway, or watching hurling matches in County Tipperary where his uncle was a rector, going to school in the French village at Port Arlington, which was a Huguenot settlement in the Irish Midlands. It still is a town with a French atmosphere and French names to this day. That's where he went to school. Then Trinity College, married a Dublin woman, so the daughter of a policeman, who didn't want to leave Dublin and, and didn't like it when, because of Carson's preferment and rising profile, she had to go to London and abandon sort of the quiet kind of uh, neighbourhood life of the Irish capital. He becomes involved in politics because of the union. As a very young man, he defended an old lady who kept getting on trains without a ticket. Not a good idea, really, for anybody. And uh, she had previous form. So, it was an open and shut case for the prosecutor in um, Dungarvan Court, County Waterford. So the old lady was arraigned in the court, and the young barrister of 25 who had come down from Dublin for the train for a guinea, um, gave a sort of Herculean display of oratory, totally tear-jerking. The jury were weeping at this poor old lady who had been manhandled off a train by uh, brutal railway porters, and she was acquitted. And he was chaired from the court. And that night, a knock came upon his hotel door. There was a deputation. And they said, Mr. Carson, we're really impressed by your oratory. You know, would you ever consider standing as our nationalist candidate for parliament in the next election? Now, there were about 10 nationalist, Protestant nationalist MPs, including the, the Reverend Isaac Nelson, a Presbyterian minister who's buried on the Shankill Road in Nelson Square. Um, uh, is called after him. So this was Carson's big chance to get into politics as a Protestant nationalist like Parnell. And he said, I'm sorry, the Union is my guiding star. And he declined it. He later would become a Crown Prosecutor against the Land League, MP for Trinity, a protege of Arthur Balfour, a rising Tory minister who had been Chief Secretary for Ireland. So he takes up the Irish cause. He really believes in it. You could really say about Carson, he was as much an Irish patriot as he was an Irish unionist, in a way, because he believed that Ireland would prosper within the empire, that all sections of the community had benefited from uh, the union, Catholic emancipation, the land acts, and all of that raft of mainly liberal reform at the turn of the 
19th century. Um, and he embraces the Ulster case. He wants to use Ulster as a weapon. And he writes to Lady Londonderry, one of his political confidants, about when it comes to talking about partition, he says, you know, I might have difficulty abandoning my own people in the West and South. He's writing in 1913. Um, and he suddenly finds that what was his weapon, the threat of partition, which he believed would kill home rule completely, that the nationalists would abandon home rule rather than risk the mutilation of the nation, as it were. Now, of course, he was wrong in that premise. And in the end, he would become a facilitator of a partition solution, rescuing the best, well, getting the best deal he could for his northern clients, six counties instead of his own favoured 32, under the Union Jack. But he would look back in anger. He was offered the prize of first Premier of Northern Ireland. I mean, when you go up to Stormont, as William Crawley will tell you tomorrow night in his brilliant documentary, Craig's in the shadows buried behind Stormont, but Carson's on the plinth as you go up the hill, you know? Um, he looks like the founding father, the architect of partition and this state. And yet, he, he declined the premiership, citing age and infirmity, yet he had another 10 years in public life. He was a hypochondriac, I have to be fair. And he also, of course, when the Free State was declared after the treaty, he stood up in the House of Lords where he had just become a law lord. Carson was then almost 70 years of age, the old warrior with the Dublin accent. And what did he say? What a fool I was. And so was Ulster and so was Ireland. I was only a puppet in the game that was to bring the Conservative Party into power. He looked back in anger at this divided Ireland. He would tell Asquith's daughter in 1928, when he looked at the Free State in the North, rather a republic than this humbug. And of course, his burial is the final act in this irony, because of course, he did come over once or twice. Jimmy Kelly very famously watched him unveiling his own statue. Um, in 1933, the Merrifield statue at Stormont. A cult had developed within the, the, the unionism of the um, formative years of this entity, when Craig was the high priest and Carson was raised to a kind of a deity, still living, you know, and then emblazoned in stone at the head of that great avenue. And Carson was slipping away in his home in the south of England. He had been suffering from depression probably from a lifetime. Everybody saw the great Carson doing the great public performance. And then he would collapse into a heap and start writing deathbed letters to his lawyers and his friends, uh, reworking his will. Though he, he would write, I'm not fit to hold the pen, but I'm dictating this. Uh, and he said, I have the worst cold I ever had. I think I'm done for. You will carry on the work, James, when I'm dead, to James Craig. Three weeks later, he's back at another meeting. And he's one of those people who wear down all around them, but live forever. You know that sort of, you all know them. So he's a hypochondriac, but he finally expires in 1935. The Unionist government learned this, and they rush a bill through the Northern Ireland Parliament called the Carson Burial Bill, enabling them to bring Lord Carson back to Belfast. He had been a first Lord of the Admiralty. No, in Britain, he would just have had an ordinary funeral, nothing special, a country churchyard. But of course, a state funeral was arranged. His body came off a boat on a grey November morning. It was borne on a gun carriage through streets with, uh, you, know, um, you know, darkened sort of scenes and, you know, kind of um, respectful crowds and finally led in St. Anne's. His family weren't very happy. There were reports that his daughters weren't very keen, but he hadn't had a very good relationship with his children. He told Lady Londonderry that his family were a rum lot. He was disappointed in them. But then he'd been away from home a lot. And as he's been led to rest in St. Anne's, now he was an Anglican. This was the greatest irony, if not mockery. Soil from each of the six counties was sprinkled on his coffin. A cynic might say he must have been revolving, this great all-Ireland unionist, being led to rest in St. Anne's. But there's another coda to all this. The Bishop of Down, Connor and Dremore, was the Reverend Frederick McNeese, the former rector of Carrickfergus, 
the father of the, the poet, Louis Magnus. And he did his damnedest to prevent Carson being buried. He did everything to obstruct it. He demanded that Craig Avon, the Prime Minister, and the Minister of Home Affairs, Dawson Bates, should appear before the select vestry to explain why this was happening in their cathedral. And he played on people's emotions. The family of Dean Seaver, a former Dean of Belfast, had a particular plaque on the wall where they were going to bury Carson. And I've seen the correspondence. He wrote to them and said, you don't realize I'm going to tear down your ancestral plaque to bury this guy. You better do something. And then he heard they were going to put a, a Union Jack flying perpetually over Carson's tomb. So Magnus made a few phone, go, phone calls and he discovered that there was no precedent anywhere on the planet for a Union Jack flying over the uh, grave of a dead statesman. So he stopped the Union Jack going up. And he played an obstructive role to the end, insisting that Carson should be buried beneath a plain tombstone at ground level, with one word on it, Carson, no eulogy. And so it remained until 1985, when um, one Peter Robinson erected another plaque on the wall above it, which tells you a bit more about Lord Carson. I hope that answers your question. Have we exhausted? One more. Um, I've always been um, somewhat intrigued in, um, by the House of Lords veto being removed by the King. I understand, if I'm recalling this correctly, that there's a threat to flood the uh, House of Lords with um, uh, Liberal um, MPs. What possessed George V to actually concede to the removal of the veto? Well, of course, um, the problem was that a government was being obstructed in its business. The government went to the country on the issue of the House of Lords. It was an even Stephen situation, but remember, not just the 83 Irish nationalists, but the 60 or so Labour MPs were also supporting the government. So you really had another 140 MPs supporting Asquith, which gave the government a good working majority. And they also believed that the powers of the House of Lords had to be curbed. Now, what happened in the end was Asquith, yes, made a threat. It would be a mass creation of peers, you know, so that you know, all sorts of Irish nationalists would become you know, perpetual peers in the House of Lords. And in the end, actually, as um, Bonner Law put it in the end, we were, you see, there was a campaign by the Lords to prevent any change, and they were going to reject this bill as well. I mean, if they'd rejected this bill, it would be in a real crisis of massive proportions for the British Constitution. But in the end, actually, uh, Bonner Law said, we were saved by the bishops and the rats. The rats were a handful of Tories who voted for the bill because they didn't want to see the essential nature of the house changed. The bishops were the, the, um, the peers spiritual, the Church of England bishops, who had a vote. And to prevent civil war, they voted for the bill. So by a very narrow majority, the Parliament Act was passed. Now, the king wouldn't have refused his signature. He didn't refuse to sign the Home Rule Bill, though he had grave reservations. The king's main concern was to move forward. And in fact, that's what happened. After the reverse over the House of Lords, the Tories didn't quite get over it. They then focused on Home Rule because obviously the Parliament Act opened the floodgates to Home Rule. But I suppose looking back, it was an essential stage in the evolution of, you know, the powers of Parliament and the primacy of the commons over the lords. Because until in the 19th century, the House of Lords was the main place to be. But that was beginning to be, that was changing massively in the late 19th century. The focus of power was now the commons. So to think that a non-elected house could block any measure, I mean, they'd thrown out all kinds of acts, the budget, education acts, um, anything that involved taxation, 
and anything, of course, that involved Ireland was going to give them um, grist for that critical mill. So in the end, the king signed it off. And in fact, in, 1940, uh, in 1945, it was further amended. It meant the Lords could only hold up legislation for one year, so their power was further reduced after the Second World War. I think maybe everybody who wants to speak has had his piece. Thank you very much. So I think your appreciation of Eamon is just an acknowledgement of the view he gave us into Belfast and this part of the world a hundred years ago and the context into which this beautiful church was constructed and then opened. So we're delighted with your presentation Eamon. Thank you very much for being with us in our centenary celebrations. And thanks also to Alice, the other half, be behind every good man, there's even a net better lady. So thank you, Alice, as well, for being with us tonight. <laughs> Just to remind you, the last of the centenary talks is this Friday night. Raphael Gallagher, one of our own redemptress confers, he's a moral theologian, taught all over Ireland, all over Europe, and is currently based in Rome. He will come and speak to us here as well. His theme is from, I suppose, confessing sins, all those confession boxes around Clonard here, it was a very strong part of our tradition here, from confessing sins to going on to reconciling communities, the way that theology, and especially moral theology, which is a big term to all of us, how that has a very practical expression and reality in our lives and in the lives of the Redemptress. So that's our final of the lectures is here on Friday night at 7.30 as well. If you haven't booked in, there's still plenty of space left, so feel free to come along. And then on Sunday, our final closing mass of the centenary. It's the last day of the centenary year, and we have a final closing mass to which all are invited, and that's here at 11.30 a.m. So there's no 11 o'clock Mass this Sunday, there's no 12.30 Mass this Sunday. It's replaced by a Mass mid-morning at 11.30. Of course, there's the usual 7 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. Masses as well. And as part of that Mass, we will confer on a number of people the honorary title of being a noblesse of the Redemptorist Congregation. And as well, we're going to install in the Shrine of Our Mother Perpetual Help a small relic and the relic is a part of the original, the one icon that was given to the Redemptress way back by the Pope to be proclaimed all over the world. We have the picture here, and we're getting part of the original picture on Sunday as well. Thank you for your presence here tonight. It was a long night, but a very worthwhile night. Safe home, and please, God, we'll see you back for the rest of the centenary celebrations. And thank you again, Amy.